Welcome to this episode of Conversations. And John, it's kind of a little special day. Uh, this is... Special week. Valentine's. Oh, it's Valentine's. I'm sorry, Va- Dave. Valentine's. Happy, va- Va- Happy Valentine's. Valentine's. Valentine's Day. And we're just going to like, some of you might say, isn't that a pagan holiday? We don't believe in Valentine's Day. Well, I want to share a little bit of history about Valentine's Day. And if you want to look it up yourself, you go can ahead, go babe. to history.com <laughs> that there are at least two men named Valentine that could have inspired the holiday. Okay. The first is Valentine, who was a priest in third century Rome. This is the one I've heard about. And as the story go, this guy, he defiled, defiled, no, defied. he defied, defied. defied kind of defiled, but defied, defied Emperor Claudius, who did a ban on marriage. He's like, heck no, because he felt like it was the distraction for the soldiers. And they, he made it he made it uh, illegal for them to get married. So what he did is he went in secret and he married couples in the spirit of love until he was caught and they killed him. Executed. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Okay. And then there's another legend suggests that Valentine was killed for attempting to help Christians escape prison in Rome and that he actually sent his first Valentine message himself while in prison, writing a letter signed from your Valentine. That's so hey, beautiful. Either way, I think this is a great guy. Yeah. And I think he feared the Lord. I think that he... Yeah, I, I yeah, do too. I, I feel, Most definitely. I, I feel like he was like, hey, God, God's got a bigger purpose than Mr. Claudius too. So let's talk about why these kind of things are important. But before we dive into that, I just want to invite all of you to subscribe, rate, review. It really helps us get this message out. And if you do that, you may get your review read just like on the way to the aisle. Wow, that's appropriate for Valentine's Day. On the way to the aisle. So this is what this is what they said. So so helpful to learn from a couple that is God centered and wanting to share their wisdom for those trying to develop and create a healthy life, marriage, and relationship with God. Thank you so much for the advice and guidance. Can't wait to show my fiance this podcast. Wow, that's so good. Yes, it is. So what are we talking about, John? Well, one week from today, one week from Valentine's Day, the Awe of God book will launch. And speaking of Valentine's Day, everybody, I dedicated this book. This is my life message. I said, my magnificent wife, best friend, and cherished love, Lisa Bevere. Okay, it's private. (laughs) A woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. It's private. It's published, actually. I wrote this book in our 40th year of marriage. Each year with you only gets better, and if given the chance, I would marry you again in a heartbeat. No words can express the delight and joy you bring to my heart. I would not be the man I am today had it not been for your love and wisdom. You are wise, fun, delightful, strong, adventurous, and gorgeous. I love you forever, babe. And, and what did I do when you read when you handed this? I, to I babe? shared it at the board meeting, our board meeting, because I knew she'd end up finding out, and I wanted to read it first. And she started crying. I put my head down and started crying. You did it's very, it was very so beautiful. It's very, very sweet. Okay. Well, we are talking again because this is this is kind of a, a this is a topic first and foremost. I know that this is a life message. I know this is a life pursuit for you. Yeah. I know that this is a key. Uh, this is what Jesus said, okay, this is what he was going to embrace. And people are like, what are you talking about? We are talking about the fear of the Lord and the awe of God, but the aspect of obedience. Can you talk about that? Well, I will, but let me kind of frame how this all started for me. Um, Back in 1994, I was asked to do a church conference. Pretty, It was the biggest church in, in many counties around. And uh, I had never preached on the fear of the Lord, but I was doing a personal study. I can I just can I pause a moment though, because I think it's really funny that we're sitting here talking about this, and I was pregnant with the son who is now the producer for this. Oh, that's I, so cool! Yeah, I just that's I true. just feel like I needed to say that for yeah, a moment. Yeah, I forgot yeah. about that. Yes. So I. I, I kept seeing the fear of the Lord, the awe of God all through scripture. And I'm, I'm like, Ooh, there's something here. It's missing. Mm-hmm. And I remember at this particular conference, God impressed on me to speak on it. So I got up, I spoke, I thought it went okay. Uh, next night I got up, I was, the, you know, I did two nights in a row. And the man before introducing me got up and corrected my message for 15 
15 minutes. I remember that. <laughs> it was uh, he basically, very awkward. He said, John basically preached error last night, and we I want to protect you from it. This is Old Testament theology and the New Testament. We don't have to fear God because perfect love casts out fear. And then he made the statement that, you know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And I'm sitting there going, oh, no. And I'll never forget. Then he introduced me to come preach. It's the hardest service I probably ever did in my life. I did a quick 30-minute message. I got out of there. The next morning, I went and found a construction site that was deserted. It was a Saturday morning. And you know, I, Wait, what you know when you say a construction site that was deserted, that sounds like mafia. So okay. that sounds like you're okay. going to bury someone. Well, the, but, the workers but weren't you, working on you, Saturday. You were, you, were, you were going to a place to pray. I just was, de <laughs> I was devastated. And I remember I started up prayer that morning. I said, God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I'm, I'm hurting your church. I'm putting people in bondage. And instead of feeling God's correction, I felt his pleasure, which really shocked me. And I found myself outside scream, uh, uh, yelling at the top of my voice, God, I want to know the holy fear of God. That's when my journey began in 1994. So here we are almost 30 years later. But uh, you look at the, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord leads to long life. The fear of the Lord eradicates all other fears. And we're going to be talking about this. But what is the evidence that somebody truly fears God? Because, you know, there, there are people that say, oh, I fear the Lord, but yet there's not evidence. The true evidence is that they delight in obeying God's commands. So they actually find joy in obedience, even if that obedience produces suffering. Now, because who for the joy set before him endured the cross? The Bible says— And that's he, talking about Jesus. That's talking about Jesus. He humbled himself and became obedient, right? So I, I remember the Holy Spirit. I said, you know, I, I always believe God puts his wisdom— in simplicity. And I said, okay, what does it really truly mean to fear God? And the Holy Spirit gave me five points. And, I, and each one is a chapter in this book. Now there's 42 chapters. It's a six-week book. You do it once a day. There's a devotional in it. It is not a devotional, but it is a real book. But I try to break it up so it make it easy for you. But this is one whole week in the book. But, but God showed me that the person that truly fears God will obey immediately. You know, David writes in Psalm 119, I will hurry to obey your commands. Wow. That, isn't that amazing? He will obey instantly. Okay. He will obey second, even if it doesn't make sense. So does it make sense to tell a bunch of sailors not to get off a ship that's sinking when there's lifeboats at hand, but yet everyone was saved? Did it make sense to walk around a wall six times silently and then blow horns on the seventh? to defeat an entire nation? Did it make sense to put mud, to spit in the ground and make mud and put it on a guy's eyes? So we obey when it doesn't make sense. We obey even if it hurts. Peter makes the statement, as Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. To, to suffer, true Christian su suffering, is not when we seek to suffer. It's when we seek to obey God, but living in a fallen world, we end up suffering. So basically, the fear of the Lord gives you the ability to look at adversity. How did these believers go to the rack, go to the stake, go to the crosses and be crucified? How did they have that kind of courage? The fear of the Lord because that empowers you to obey God no matter what the circumstances. So obey instantly, obey when it doesn't make sense, obey when it hurts, obey when you don't see a benefit. Did it make sense for Esther to go before the Persian king who happened to be her husband when she wasn't invited? If he didn't point the scepter at her, her head came off. Nobody knew she was a Jew. The whole Jewish race was going to be annihilated in one day. Nobody knew she was, she's queen to the Persian king. Nobody knows she's Jewish except her cousin Mordecai. And she says to Mordecai, I'm going before the king, and if I die, I die. She feared God. One of my favorite Old Testament characters exemplifying what the fear of the Lord is. And then fifth, it means you obey God to completion. Do you know Saul killed 99.9999% of what God told him to do? God said, go kill every Amalekite, every man, woman, child, kill every single animal. Saul, look, he took 250,000 
100,000 warriors to go against Amalekites. So they got to at least have, let's just say, 100,000. He kills 99,999 people, saved one guy alive. He keeps the best animals to give it to the people so they can sacrifice to the Lord. God says you're in rebellion. Now, why would Saul do it? Fear of the Lord addresses motives. This is the number one message of this book. It deals with your motives. Okay, I, I, I want to be able to trust my motives. I want to be able to trust my intentions. When you fear God, you can. So why would Saul kill all those people and save the king alive? Because when you got a king that you have annihilated his country and he is a living prisoner in your palace... Everybody that comes in to your throne room and sees that that king, that former king who's now prisoner in your palace, it's a living trophy for him. Why does he want to give the animals to the people to sacrifice to the Lord? Because they're a religious nation and he wants popularity. So it's all, his motive is all about serving self instead of obeying God to fulfill God's heart desire. So the fear of the Lord means we obey God because we want God's heart desire fulfilled more than we want anything else. So John, years ago, yep. because of your pursuit, you wrote a book called The Fear of the Lord. Yes. How is this book, again, living with you, I know the answer. How <laughs> how does this book add to this? And I, I'm just going to pause it for a moment and say, there's a big difference between writing a book when you're in your 30s yep. and writing a book when you're in your 60s. 60s because God layers a weight of experience, of faithfulness, of um, of seeing. Like John and I have seen a lot of people start out really smart and end up really stupid because a lack of the awe of God, yep. a lack of holy fear. So let's talk a little bit yep. because we've had people say, I love the fear of the Lord. Is this it revised and updated? You know, here's the thing. There's absolutely nothing new under the sun, but there's there's something a lot of fresh material. Yes, okay. So I this is not address a rewrite. Okay. This is 30 years of God teaching me more and more about the fear of the Lord. The first book I really emphasized order, glory, judgment. This book I really emphasize the motives, how the fear of the so it's Lord. More of a addresses. personal. It more really of a goes personal. to your okay. heart. Yeah, That's this awesome. one would be a lot more personal. The other one, I, you know how this all happened is I read the fear of the Lord because we, we needed to print more, right? Or the publisher was going to print more. And I said, this message is really not relevant to the millennials and to the Gen Z's. And even or even to our day, even yep. yeah, even to our day. And I and I started praying, and Lisa and our book agent kept saying, you got to write the book on the fear of the Lord. You got well, I started praying and I felt like the Holy Spirit said in 2022, I started writing in February of 2022, so a year ago, write it now. And because God spoke to me 30 years ago, Lisa, and he said, the final move of my spirit on this earth before Jesus returns is going to be a move of the awe of God, the fear of the Lord. And he said, that move will produce a holy church because the apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 having the promise of God dwelling with us in his greatness in his glory let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God now the the it's the fear of the Lord that perfects holiness not the love of God and I remember somebody telling me who had was in trouble with the law he was in prison he said John I love Jesus but I didn't fear God well he wasn't living a holy life. Why? He said, I love Jesus, but I was in sin. The fear of the Lord gives you the power to depart from evil. That's what scripture says. This is why Paul the apostle, who had the revelation of grace, Lisa, writes, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not work out your salvation with love and kindness. Work out your salvation. Now, what does it mean to work out? It means to mature your salvation. So the reason we have been losing millions of people in Christianity, literally, a survey says that we've lost 40 million people in the last 20 years. 20 million of those people, they still, if you push them in the corner, they'll say, I'm a Christian, but they don't pray anymore and they don't gather anymore. The other 20 million are now professed agnostics, atheists, and spiritualists. 20 million. 
Okay, so we're talking 40 million in this group. America's population is 332 million. We're talking over 10% of the entire American population. That means one out of every 10 Americans has walked away from Christianity. We're losing, statistics says, over a million young people a year to the faith. They go to universities and they come back not believers. So what's missing? What is the protection that keeps us from walking away? It is the awe, the fear of God. And if you look at Psalm 19, verse 9, it says that the fear of the Lord is clean. So just as Paul said, it produces a real purity in our lives. The fear of the Lord is clean, but then he says, enduring forever. You know, Lucifer led wet worship right before the throne of God. He beheld the glory of God. Can you imagine? But he didn't endure because he didn't fear the Lord. Well, and I, I remember studying this when I was writing Without Rival, but there was a familiarity. And, and I think that familiarity yeah. uh, comes in where, where uh, Lucifer was like, okay, I am in the presence of God. And then he starts to, it goes from worship to admiration to I could be like God. And, and that's, that, was, that was Lucifer's journey. And it says that iniquity of pride So pride is a manifestation of the lack of the fear of God. You know, I was thinking, John, as you were talking of the scripture where it says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Can you talk a little bit about that? Paul is talking about the... This is not speaking to unbelievers. This is speaking to believers. He said, all of us believers are going to stand before Jesus in judgment. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And he said that at that judgment seat, our darkest secrets and our private motives are all going to be exposed, all be exposed. And that's when he says, we're going to be examined for the good we did in the body, for the works we did in the body of Christ, whether good or evil. And he says, whether good or evil. And so in Second Corinthians or First Corinthians chapter four, verse five, he says, our darkest secrets and private motives are going to be revealed. In Second Corinthians chapter five, because Paul's talking to a very carnal church when he writes to the Corinthians. They're a lot like the American church. Yeah. Okay. He's, he's talking to just newly born again Greeks. Yep. Yes. That are acting like the world. Yeah. And he said to them, Do you not realize that you're going to be judged even on the evil that you did? And, and he's speaking to believers. now, And he's not talking about our sins. Our sins have been eradicated. I'm talking about my motive is to be seen. Okay, let, let, let's just give an example of an evil motive. My motive is to be seen. I, I want to be on that platform preaching because I want people to, to respect me. I want to be popular. I want to be seen on Instagram because I want to be popular. These are motives that are self-serving. And James says, when you have this kind of wisdom, when you are seeking selfish motives, mm-hmm. He said, there is confusion in every evil work there. Now this, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, willing to yield, gentle, right? The the fear of the Lord is the beginning. It's the starting place of wisdom. So the wisdom, there's the wisdom of this world that's earthly, sensual, and demonic, which is really interesting. There's three different descriptions there. And then there's the wisdom from above. The wisdom from above doesn't even begin until you fear God, because it addresses the motives of your heart and you make decisions now based out of a heart for God, not a selfish motive heart. And so it's so important. If you look at Eve, Eve chose what was she thought was good for her, right? It was the, when she saw the tree was good, she wasn't drawn to the evil side of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. She was drawn to the good side. When she saw it was good. So what is Eve saying? I know God told me not to touch it, not Not, to eat it, not to eat it, not to eat it, but that fruit will make me wise. That fruit is good for me. She chose that motive and that's why we're in the mess we're in today. Well, wait a minute. I'm going to stop you there. Well, it's because of Adam. I know. Thank you. I'm staying corrected. I stand corrected. Because nothing happened. Uh uh. Wife, we are not doing this. And I believe there would there there, we wouldn't have had a fall. It's when nothing happened until Adam ate it. And it says through one man's trespass and disobedience. And through one man's I support. So the fear of the Lord just came, became present right now. Uh, The the fear of the Lord's one. But so anyway, just to recap, so the manifestation of the fear of God. Now, listen, you can't just try to work this up. The fear of the Lord has to be caught. 
Okay. So, but anyway, it, no, it also wait, was no, taught. Wait. No, I want I want you to pause a moment there because not first of all, yeah. we're saying there's a problem where we don't have it right in our churches or where. So, so somebody is listening to this podcast, John, and and they say, okay, I'm going to grab your book and I'm going to read about. But but there is. There is a interaction with the presence of God. Yep. So what would you say to somebody that says, okay, I've never heard this. I, I want to be in awe of God. I've only heard God's my buddy. God's my friend. He's like me. He wants me happy. He wants, you know, he wants whatever I want for me, uh, whatever the, the nonsense that has come in. How, how, how does a person invite the fear of God or the awe of God into their life? You know, it's amazing, Lisa. <clears throat> I discovered in my journey, this is one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. It says in Isaiah 11, the spirit of the Lord should rest upon Jesus, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, and the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord. And then verse three says, this is Isaiah 11, his delight yeah. was in the fear of the Lord. Now, Isaiah 33 verse six tells us that the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. So stop and think about it. It's God's treasure. It's Jesus' delight. It's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those what? Who ask. But then Peter makes the statement in John chapter or Acts chapter five, that God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. Obey from the heart. So if I'm selfishly looking for the Holy Spirit because I want power, like the guy in yeah. Acts chapter yeah. eight, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to receive yeah. the sorcerer. Mm -hmm. But if I want to fulfill the will of God on earth, if I want to walk in intimacy with God, if I want to walk in his wisdom, which brings life, mm -hmm. then when I ask for the spirit of the fear of the Lord, and I do this, Lisa, almost Every single morning in prayer, I say, God, I want a fresh baptism of the fear of the Lord, the Holy Spirit of the That's fear of the I Lord. That's what I was looking for. I, so so okay. he, here's something. No, at, no, here's here's what I want you to hear, because John is the one who mentored me. And I remember John saying, Lisa, before you read scripture, pray, yep. pray, invite the Holy Spirit to illuminate God's word, uh, to actually begin to reveal things in your life that are the antithesis of the awe of God, the antithesis of obedience. And so I want to say to you out there, one of the things I love the most about my husband, yes, he, he writes amazing books. Yes, he, he preaches amazing sermons. But John has, for, for as long as I have known him, sought to honor the presence of God. And we've seen, we've seen the manifestation of the holy awe, the holy fear of God come in. And so I would say, I would say that when you get this book, we're not, we're not, this is not just a how to book like, oh, I'm going to read about the awe of God. I'm going to check a list. This is an invitation to experience the awe of God. It's an invitation for you to experience God's presence. It's an invitation into obedience. And everything that John was saying, we're not saying these things about the judgment. You're going to give an account of how you did things to make you feel guilty or afraid. We're actually trying to add weight that you can move forward in confidence and obedience, knowing full well that no matter what it looks like, no matter what people are saying to you, that God has your back, that you are living in the awe of God instead of the fear of man. Yeah. Yeah. And John, this is, this is a special program. This is a special program because this is your launch week. So I'm going to, you know, like it's, it's, this is happening. So I want you to do something before we close out. I want you to pray for the people. Can you pray for them that they would begin to have a hunger? Because I think right now yeah. there's, there's a lot of hunger for the things of the world. Can you pray for people to have a hunger for the awe of God? And, and will you pray for them that it will not just be a, a, a revelation that they visit once, but that it'll become a lifestyle? Yeah. Heavenly Father, you said repentance is a gift from you. And we're so grateful for it because it's genuinely when we have a change of heart, a change of mind. And I know there are people listening right now, and I sense you're showing me, Holy Spirit, that while they have heard the word of the Lord, 
they have gone, oh, I want this, I want this, I have been too lackadaisical, I've taken the Word of God so casually, I've taken the presence of God so casually, I've treated Him like a buddy. Lord, I'm so sorry. I hear people saying that in their hearts. So, Father, I am interceding on behalf of these beautiful people that are listening right now, and I am asking that you would baptize them in the holy awe of God, the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord. I am asking even that your presence would come upon them right now, and and Lord, as they continue in journey through this book, we know that you said that I will teach you the word of the Lord in Psalms 37. Come near, come close, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I believe, Holy Spirit, you gave this book systematically laid out so that, Lord, you could speak to their hearts as they read. So let this be the beginning and let it continue as they continue in their personal pursuit in their Bibles and also reading this book to complement it. I just thank you for this now in Jesus mighty name. Amen. Yeah. So the book is coming out in a week, John. In one week. Yeah. And it's really easy to get. And for those of you in, in the United States, probably your easiest way if you're a prime member, just go to Amazon. Now, if you're outside of the country or if you're in the United States and you say, no, I'd rather go to your website, you can go to johnbevere.com. I think our team is offering have, actually some fun little yes, bonus things absolutely. Uh, at johnbevere.com that will be a real blessing to you. There's a course that comes with this. This book comes out in, it's it's an audible book. It's also on the Kindle and it's also in, it's going to be a beautiful hardback book. This is just an advanced reading copy for people that do. But it, as I said, it's 42 chapters. At at the end of every chapter, we have the five P's. Yeah. <laughs> the, These are practical applications. Right. The, yeah. the, the, the passage, the promise, or the point, excuse me, the ponder, the uh, prayer, and then the ponder. No, or no, no the, 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 the profession. Profession. So anyway, it just it's it's made, it's only six chapters or six pages per chapter. It's made easy for you to read. It, it, it's meant to be done in six weeks. You can do it in three weeks if you do a chapter in the morning, chapter at night, or you can read it in two days, however you want. It's just we try to lay it out in a way that would make it work into your lifestyle. We are so excited. We'd love to hear testimonies. Please give us testimonies on how this message has impacted your life. And so, Lisa, why don't you... Yeah, I believe that you're going to actually uh, begin to see God's Word in a completely different way, maybe even parent in different ways, interact in relationships in different ways, interact with social media in different ways. Yes. And so we, we do want to hear from you. So it really helps if you give us some feedback, rating, reviewing, subscribing, sharing this podcast with friends. We love all of that. And we also want to invite you, you can jump on Messenger X app, and that is a great way to move forward with your discipleship journey. So until next time, this has been Conversations with John and Lisa Bevere. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Conversations with John and Lisa Bevere. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and rate this podcast wherever you love to listen. Also, if you haven't already, go right ahead and download Messenger X to hear more content from John and Lisa Bevere and other great messengers. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on Conversations with John and Lisa.